think that's rapidly changing. China is currently, I think, about two or three percent, but that number we believe will, you know, increase in the near future. And tech, biotechnology, as some of you may know, is one of the critical emerging industries that um, is not only in Made in China 2025, as highlighted by the Chinese government, but it's also a industry that the U.S. government has listed as one that some of these Section 301 and investment policies will, will need to protect. So it'll be interesting to see what both countries do in terms of you know, growing and promoting the sector, or could this trade war actually tank some of the progress that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years? Um, but let me then take the opportunity to quickly introduce and give an opportunity to our other panelists to talk, to maybe have them introduce themselves and then also give a quick, some feedback on, um, on their initial thoughts from uh, what we've heard from Yukon. Let me first introduce Ambassador Craig Allen from the U.S.-China Business Council. First of all, I want to congratulate Ambassador Allen on returning to the States and taking over his new role as president of USCBC. I'm going to let... Okay. Previously, Ambassador Allen was the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Brunei and has a long and distinguished career in supporting and promoting U.S.-China relations. I'm actually going to keep my presentation short because I want Craig to maybe talk a little bit about what he is doing in U.S.-China Business Council. So, Craig, let me turn it to you first. Oh, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, hello, hello. Is that okay? Is that working? Okay, well, let me thank you very much. Let me also thank my friend of many years, Monica He. She, uh, previously, she worked for in the White House at the United States Trade Representative, and we negotiated together uh, with China for many years, and I would say very successfully. And a lot of progress uh, w was made uh, in uh, those uh, negotiations. Um, I also want to thank President Haipei uh, for his pro bono work for putting this together. I think it's a, a great program. I want to thank uh, my friend Yukon Huang. Um, I have admired Yukon's work for many years, for uh, more than 20 years. Um, but I would highly recommend to any of you who have not purchased his uh, most recent book, Cracking the, the China Conundrum, to, that is a very valuable piece of scholarship. And he takes a, a different view, uh, unconventional uh, always, and at least from my perspective, I have always uh, learned uh, from that. So uh, I give it uh, the strongest of all recommendations. For me, returning to the China world after a four-year vacation in Southeast Asia, uh, this book was very, uh, very valuable. Let me say just a couple words about the U.S.-China Business uh, Council. Uh, we, uh, I believe we have two members, Angela and China. Uh, maybe you could just wave uh, over, over here. Um, the, the U.S.-China Business Council has uh, 207, 208 members, uh, all American headquartered companies. Uh, most of them have invested heavily in China. Uh, so our chairman is the chairman of Chubb, Evan Greenberg. Our two vice chairs are Mary Barra of General Motors and Doug McMillan of Walmart. And uh, we are, our purpose is to advocate for American business in China. And uh, we would love to have more members. Uh, so for American domiciled companies that are here, uh, please uh, speak to us. We would love to welcome you. Uh, and if you're doing business in China, uh, this might be of use. So let me say uh, about our members and the trade war. I think that uh, the way I would describe how this is affecting American business uh, is a, a little bit like uh, Tolstoy in Anna Katrina. The first uh, sentence in, of Tolstoy is that, all happy families are happy in the same way, and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own unique, special way. 
And today, uh, most of the families doing business in China are all unhappy, but they're unhappy in their own unique, special way. Not everyone is uh, being affected in uh, the same way. So let me just take uh, less than a minute and uh, note that uh, the people who are most affected are those who trade a lot between the US and China. If you are a buyer in China and, and um, uh, exporting to the US, then you are deeply affected by the, as Yukon uh, uh, noted. Also now, because China has uh, put up retaliatory tariffs against US tariffs of the same, not the same amount, but the same ratio uh, uh, of trade. If you're an American exporter to China, you are being affected. And if you haven't been affected yet, then uh, many people, including myself, uh, are anticipating yet another round. And uh, you, it could be uh, as much as uh, uh, virtually all trade between the two countries subject to uh, a tariff uh, within the next uh, nine months or so, unless there is a resolution to this problem. Uh, however, uh, if you're a manufacturer in China and you only manufacture in China, you sell in China, uh, you're not that affected. Or if your uh, supply chains are from, else, uh, from uh, Australia or Europe or, or uh, Taiwan, then you're not that affected. Also, service companies, and many of our companies are service companies, are relatively unaffected uh, by the tariffs so far. However, the Chinese uh, government has noted that they uh, reserve the use of what they call qualitative measures. And qualitative measures is, uh, sounds nice, uh, not nice. Uh, what it would mean would be withholding licenses, uh, increased inspections, uh, closing down of operations, um, uh, uh, additional labor uh, activities at, at American operations. So we have not seen So let me then segue to Jane Chan, who is the COO of Himalayan Capital. Jane, if you could quickly introduce yourself and I'd like to have maybe one thought from you of um, UConn's presentation or your takeaway from the trade war. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Himalayan Capital is a, a private fund. Uh, uh, we uh, manage uh, um, around nine billion US dollar. AOM. Uh, we have been in business for 20 years. Um, we embrace a uh, value investing uh, strategy, uh, which uh, we uh, uh, look for a great companies selling at uh, uh, discount price, uh, heavily discount price, <laughs> which we call margin of safety. So we look more on the downside protection. Uh, we invest uh, on behalf of institutional investors, uh, mostly in Asia. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, I, I have concern on this uh, trade war is, uh, I, I, I guess it's uh, in the three different areas. One is uh, as a professional investor, uh, so what could be the impact of this trade war on the global economy, uh, politically in Asia and also in China, you know, what eventually uh, that could have uh, impact on our um, investment uh, uh, there. Even though right now, uh, at this moment, I have to say that <laughs> the, the impact on our business, uh, our investment is uh, quite limited. But I do worry about the long-term impact. Uh, secondly, is as a U.S. citizen, I do worry about you know, what's the impact on the United States, on our economy here. Because I think our economy even though everybody think pretty optimistic because our economy is doing pretty well, but look at our uh, stock market. Certainly there's a bubble there and there's a huge, huge bubble. And I can see a lot of the investment practice in this country now uh, it has a lot of uh, danger implications. And 
The lastly, you know, as a Chinese American, I do worry about if this trade war uh, eventually, you know, escalate, as just uh, Dr. Huang said, <laughs> it could may not be a good solution, you know, short, short termly. Um, so, uh, what could be the impact on the Chinese American here um, as a part of this uh, uh, society? So, um, you know, Dr. Huang's presentation, I, you know, I really appreciate that greatly uh, because it really, uh, you know, get to the bottom of this trade war. You know, what, what is, what's the, what's the, you know, on all the, these different things talk, people talking about, uh, you know, President Trump talking about on the surface, what's really the issue there? So this economic uh, structure uh, tension uh, between the United States and America, uh, 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 of America and China, and uh, also you know uh, the the long term uh, change of this, you know what could happen to these two countries? Uh, that's probably not only really, you know can cannot be easily resolved. Resolved, uh, you know the structural problem will always be there. You know how do we resolve that? And uh, um, whether that will be eventually lead to a war between the two countries. Um, so you know, I I really do have a, you know, pretty deep concerns on that. Thank you, Jean. No, that's really well put, and I do agree that you know the question is you know the, are the tensions going to be well restricted within the parameter of trade. Or could this have spillover effects, which I think some of us have already seen in our industries, to other industries and other areas of civic discourse? Right? And I understand yesterday the program has panels that looked at discrimination. And I think this is one of the reasons why the UCA convention is so timely and important, is that not only there are there need to be you know, ways and channels to resolve the US-China trade war, but that we need groups like UCA to be able to stand up and speak on behalf of Chinese Americans who are very much not only in this lane from a business and economic perspective, but from our social and from our you know, um, citizenship perspective, that we need to be able to operate in both countries and both cultures. Um, so thank you, Jing. I now want to um, introduce Dr. Mingtao Huang, uh, Mingtao Jiang, who we're very honored to have a, a, a U.S. farmer on our panel, because <laughs> generally, and only, <laughs> you know, because I think um, President Trump and the administration have talked so much about their need to protect the American heartland, right? The the U.S. farmers, ranchers, um, and that. Usually, you don't think about Chinese Americans being part of that, but we very much are very integrated into every aspect of the social fabric in the United States. And so I want to introduce Ming Tao and maybe have him speak a little bit about his experience and, um, and being a, a, a farmer in the American heartland and what have your experience been in regard to the U.S.-China trade war. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to this convention. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Huang, for your insightful presentation. Uh, it's an honor to share the stage with you. I was, I, about 20 years ago, I was watching CCTV4. You were being interviewed by, uh, at that time, as a, a World Bank chief in China, I think. And Alan will be so happy to join the uh, US-China chambers, as we have operations in Beijing, Shanghai, and southern China. Uh, as most of you know that I uh, come from Wisconsin, uh, some of you have tried our bottle products. Uh, I'm a Jensen farmer uh, with an academic or medical background, the one and only. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, with the current U.S.-China trade war, I guess uh, we have to go back a little bit. For the last 40 years, U.S. and China has been in this Romans, that the U.S. would like to uh, transform China to a more democratic system. And in the process, China has become richer and richer, which I think uh, U.S. Uh, is 
contribute significantly to China's uh, modernization efforts. Now, from the Chinese perspective, uh, with a civilization of 5,000 years, and it has declared it want to pursue its own route, the so-called China model, and that has caused quite a bit of tension. From the foreign policy circle uh, over the last six, seven years, you know, there has been uh, thinking that is China has got a free ride or gets most benefits of the globalization, so they can't regret that. So this, strate this strategic competition boils into the uh, current U.S.-China trade war. Uh, I don't see there's a short-term solution to it. Now, for, from a farmer's perspective, uh, Jensen, as you know, uh, is more like a, a symbol of U.S.-China relationship. Why I say that? 1784, the first vessel, commercial vessel, set sail from New York Harbor to China. The, the ship was called the Empress of China, Zhongguo Huang Hou Hao. And on board this ship, it had, guess what? 30 ton of American ginseng, <laughs> along with some silver, of course, pelts. And it took it six months to get to China, to Canton. So that's the uh, origin of Hua Qi Guo or Hua Qi Shen, American ginseng. Uh, ginseng, as a symbol, was put on the tariff. Actually, before the last two rounds of tariff increase, it was caught in the first round of the steel and aluminum trade dispute. So there was a 15% increase in tariff, and there is also an increase in recent, in the second round, I think. So as a result, our cost has increased by 25%, and there has been a long delay in terms of clearing our import or export to China. Uh, it's currently, for example, uh, the last batch of our export in April, is still being held at Beijing airport for testing. So yes, uh, as a farmer, we do feel the effects of U.S.-China trade war. And on Jensen, by the way, it's not being covered by the Trump administration's $12 billion uh, subsidies. Yeah, because uh, it's still only about $30 million uh, business compared to billions of dollars of soybean export. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Mingtao. No, definitely puts that into perspective. Um, so our trade organization also represents the soybean farmers who are covered under that subsidy, but it's a very small band-aid, I think, to try to fix this problem that was created by the same people that are trying to give them the subsidy. Um, but a lot of the farmers in the soybean market are actually tr choosing to put their product in storage and waited this out if they can, because the, pro the price of U.S. soybeans have plummeted so much. And meanwhile, competitors like Brazil can't sell enough of the product to China. So let me then uh, maybe um, pose a few questions to our panel. I'm going to start with Ambassador Craig Allen. Now, Craig, I know that you just very recently, I hope that mic works, yeah. Um, led a high-level delegation of U.S. business executives to China. I think this is a very interesting time where a lot of that, uh, there's so much uncertainty and so much impact on the U.S. business community that um, it would be really, I think it would be important if you could share what are you hearing from the Chinese government? You know, because they, uh, they have been retaliating tit for tat on this trade war. But I think the senior leadership have also said, well, they're going to help pr protect the business environment. Is that happening? Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much. So the tradition of Chinese trade negotiations is very much uh, tit for tat. So it, it will be an equal reply for every problem or, or benefit. And um, I would say that that um, tit for tat negotiating strategy is still very much in place. Um, at the same time, uh, the Chinese leadership, I think, realizes very clearly 
that uh, this is a serious problem and it is getting ready to deal with it in a number of different ways. One is that there are uh, tariff reductions that took place last week and freeing up of investment restrictions. So the Chinese government, in that sense, one could argue that the Trump administration pressure has had uh, a, a very positive uh, effect of uh, some liberalization within the market. The second thing that the Chinese government is doing is working uh, actively, and I, I, I suspect quite effectively, at the macroeconomic level, level to uh, stop the deleveraging program and to increase investment, particularly into third and fourth tier uh, cities. Uh, also, um, the Chinese government has uh, prepared uh, for negotiations and um, has told us uh, that they are uh, ready for detailed talks on uh, perhaps not the full list of issues given to them by the Trump administration, but on the bulk of them. So you hear different things that's been reported in the press that uh, 30 to 40 percent of the demands by the Trump administration are, are per perfectly fine. 30 to 40 percent they could work on with uh, a time lag. In other words, maybe that requires legislation, um, which is, uh, I think, reasonable. And then uh, 20 to 30 percent that may be beyond a red line uh, that uh, perhaps uh, involve national security concerns. So. Uh, I think that the next step uh, is that the two presidents will be in the same room at the same meeting in Buenos Aires, November 30, not far from now, and we are hopeful that a, uh, con uh, that a conclusion, that an agreement uh, can be made at that time uh, that would be a truce or a ceasefire uh, or, uh, and a plan to go forward in a more constructive manner. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Yukon. Yukon, I know that, you know, as a U.S.-China expert, you often talk about, you often have a chance and opportunity to talk to U.S. senior leaders, both in the administration as well as on Capitol Hill. Can you share a little bit of what are you hearing from them? What are their concerns and what are they telling you in terms of what China needs to do for both sides to resolve this? in a timely fashion. Thanks, Monica. It's a very good question. If you ask the Chinese what the problem is, they will say, uh, we're waiting for America to tell us what they want. If you ask the US government, how do you solve this problem? They'll respond by saying, we're waiting for the China to see what they will offer. Now, why is it that neither side can be very precise? And the answer is because the problem hasn't even been defined. And the solutions, therefore, are not obvious. So if you go into the US government, there are different views in the Treasury, in the Commerce, in Congress, and the White House. There isn't a consensus. And at the very top, the very top makes the decision these days. But it's very hard to get a sense of what the very top wants. So I think that's the nature of the problem. And that's why, as Ambassador just indicated, November there's going to be a meeting at the very highest level. But if, you, if there's going to be change, it's going to be, one, the political situation is different. Or two, the economic situation is different. Now the economic implications will take time, so that's not going to happen for a year. The political situation may be the midterm elections. But then, if you're talking about the full term, another couple of years. So, I'm not very optimistic, and that's why I wrote, I wrote an article in the New York Times Monday. The title was The Obvious But Unlikely Solution to the Trade War. And the point I was making is, the problem here is the U.S. and China cannot solve the problem. Somebody else has to solve the problem for them. So I talk about who that somebody else might be. <laughs> That's a major teaser. <laughs> but you can find Yukon's recommendation both in the end of the New York Times article as well as actually on his very last slide that he has just given, a, um, that he has just given presentation for. Um, 
Let me circle back to this because I think actually that answer has to come from Craig Allen <laughs> because I think we have such a distinguished panel that we have all the right uh, people in place and that actually hopefully maybe we can resolve this now and here, right? No, no it's not going to happen. But Yukon, why don't you extrapolate on that a little more? Talk about what do you think could, uh, USCBC or even US, um, the UCA can potentially, what role can community organizations or trade organizations as these can play in helping to resolve the tensions? He's an economist and an engineering genius all, all at the same time. Um, I think that, um, uh, let me run through the list of issues uh, very quickly that uh, you, the, the president is trying to deal with. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, so social, market socialism with Chinese characteristics is how the Communist Party refers to the economic policy of China. And I think it's legitimate to ask if those uh, uh, market socialism with Chinese characteristics is WTO compatible, number one, and number two, is it economically sustainable? Will it lead to economic growth in an in era of um, innovation and entrepreneurship? Um, so, uh, the key uh, issues uh, that uh, we would like to see addressed are uh, the role of state-owned enterprises. Uh, SOEs or state-owned enterprises often have a monopoly in China. Uh, they're poorly run. Uh, they waste enormous amounts of capital and they freeze out private investors and uh, foreign investors. Number two, the, and related is subsidies. Uh, the amount of money going into subsidies, industrial and otherwise, uh, Belt and Road program, et cetera, are enormous. And these are intimately tied to the SOEs. And this leads to overcapacity. So we have enormous overcapacity in steel and aluminum and solar panels. And that's why the president reacted with the 232. Um, also, these subsidies are not transparent. Uh, they're massive. Um, third, there are systemic problems with uh, how foreign enterprises are treated. Uh, in China, you know, uh, Ch northern China and southern China are more different than uh, Sweden and Albania. And um, therefore, Chinese law is oftentimes very vague uh, and in principle only. And that leads to discrimination against foreign companies uh, because uh, that's the way it is. So if you are designated an FIE or foreign invested enterprise, uh, courts and regulators will treat you generally not so good. Uh, and it's a real problem. Why are, should foreign companies be treated differently from Chinese companies? It's an issue, it's an important issue of principle. Um, uh, and Intellectual property rights and, um, and technology transfer, I think that Dr. Huang was uh, exactly right uh, to focus on this. Uh, we don't have rules of the road going forward, but China's industrial policy, which favors SOEs, state-owned enterprises, with huge subsidies is a problem and it needs to be addressed and we're hopeful that progress will be made on these uh, issues uh, in November. So. From in, in conclusion, the U.S.-China Business Council certainly supports uh, the uh, objectives of the Trump administration, uh, but uh, the medicine uh, that has been applied uh, is having uh, very uh, negative consequences, unintended consequences, both for American companies and most important for American ginseng farmers. <laughs> and actually, it's a great segue to uh, Mingtao because, you know, as Yukon and Craig has laid out, this is a very high level negotiation, or if there is any negotiation at all, between the two highest level of government. Meanwhile, we know that, you know, um, Ambassador Lighthizer, who is 
President Trump's architect of the trade war, have said when you make a omelet, you're going to have to break some eggs. So I think this administration is prepared and is aware that certain companies will suffer and they will hurt. And that if this trade war does become a long haul, um, there could be some, un as Craig said, unintended consequences for both economies of both sides. But meanwhile, back to Mintel, when you are a US business trying to make do and survive and grow in this economy, you know, what are some things that you should keep in mind? So let me bring that down to the ground level and ask Ming Tao, what advice do you have for US businesses, both big and small? Um, you know, as our two governments, the Chinese government and, our, and the US government are, you know, going through the motions and debating and negotiating um, outcomes or solutions, what should small businesses or even large businesses think about to survive in this kind of context? Thank you, Monica. Uh, the short answer is, uh, if the Chinese don't eat our ginseng, right? Ginseng will make America great again. <laughs> you know what ginseng does, right? <laughs> so, uh, as a farmer or Jensen farmer in particular, of course, uh, this trade uh, war brings into our uh, uncertainty in our planning. Uh, for soybean or corn farmers, uh, the same season harvest, right? For Jensen farmers, it's a three to five years adventure. So we had to plan like uh, three years ahead of time. Uh, before I came here, uh, I was talking to the biggest, uh, one of the bigger, uh, biggest grower in Wisconsin. Obviously, they are more impacted by that one. Uh, apart from the tariff, also uh, the currency depression in China also, also causing problem for us. So we have, well, we are hoping for the best, but I don't see a short-term solution to this. Uh, so we have to be maybe scaling down our production and turn to a different business model. For example, go to uh, value-added products instead of just exporting uh, the, the roots. For a soybean farmer, uh, soybean or uh, corn farmers, uh, their market is very limited, right? Once, uh, for example, if China expands production in Ukraine or in uh, Far East uh, Russia, uh, the farmers will suffer. Uh, already, let's say, uh, the, the dairy farmers are suffering already. Thank you, and that is really, really tough to hear. And that is the reality of this trade war. I also want to go to Jing. You know, as an investor, you're always looking at the strategic long-term prospect of what's going to happen, right, in the future. Um, what do you think are some of your takeaways, given the current, what is happening in the trade war? What do you see in terms of investment trends or opportunities or challenges in the near or long-term future? Well, uh, certainly, uh, this changes some uh, fundamental assumptions we have when we are uh, uh, doing those investments. The companies we started, uh, we invest, uh, because we take a bottom-up approach. So we pick the companies. Uh, we don't really, we don't think too much about the market. But we do see, uh, think about the, the general economic environment seriously. Um, uh, it, it does change some of the fundamental assumptions we have on our investment themes. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, in, not, not in the place really predict what's going to happen in the future. But we, you know, to think about the downside, we have to think about, we have to prepare for the worst. You know, what could be the worst scenario in the future? And I think, uh, you know, uh, this trade war, besides the structure tension, um, uh, we, uh, Dr. Huang was uh, talking about, Dr. Huang also pointed, really surprised <laughs> for me, the, the, the slides on the uh, misunderstanding you know, in the United States about uh, China's position in the world and also the Chinese um, the rest of the world. 
Uh, I think a lot of the issue could come from uh, uh, mis mis misunderstanding uh, uh, you know, between these two um, uh, economic powers, especially you know, in, in China. I think uh, uh, China's growth, uh, there's no way for us to stop. It, it is there once it's getting into this uh, mode of uh, modernization. Uh, you know, it's unstoppable by anybody, uh, any country. Uh, any leader. So it will happen, it will be a reality. It's just how we deal with this reality. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, um, uh, for the long run, uh, you know, if we cannot, uh, you know, find a way to live with, peacefully with each other, <laughs> you know, whether there will be another Cold War, we know like, you know, what happens in the Cold War? What happens, you know, to the overall economy? I think, uh, you know, everybody thinks China benefits greatly from the global, uh, you know, global economy, right? The, uh, but I think the benefit most is everybody, including the United States. We also benefit greatly from, you know, the global economy. And uh, there's a fundamental, <laughs> I think, a fundamental rule of the nature that uh, in the open system, an open economy will definitely do better than the closed economy. So, um, so I, th I, th I think, uh, you know, uh, probably for us, the most important thing we can do, you know, I think uh, in terms of the, all the policies, the, what the president think about, you know, what he want to get, you know, what we can do is probably limited for short term, but we do can play some rules in terms of voice out, like, uh, you know, rational voice, like Dr. Huang need to be heard by the whole society, by more people. And we could do more of the work, you know, to try to bridge the misunderstanding, to make it let people know better, you know, what's going on in China, what's going on in the rest of the world. Okay, thank you, Ching. Kirk, I know you, you know, in your capacity at USCBC, you speak with a lot of companies that are in this bilateral relationship. What are you hearing from them? Hello? Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to really strongly support what Jean just said. Um, I think it's uh, profoundly uh, important, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the one thing that is very certain is that uncertainty has increased. And for investors, this has been really, really difficult. Uh, Chinese investment into the United States has declined very very sharply and uh, for mayors or governors uh, around the United States, this is a not good news. Um, mayors and governors uh, all welcome uh, Chinese investment. For American investors in China, particularly those who are in the middle of a, of a large factory or a large project who have multiple billions of dollars that they're, they're putting into the ground, or, or Chinese investors who want to put money into the ground here. What does it mean? What's the future? Can they be, will, can they be sure what the tariff is going to be? What about the political ramifications uh, of this, both in China and in the United States? So what worries me the most is that investment is being deferred. And with uh, deferring that investment, it will have an impact on economic growth, for sure. Um, and uh, I, I think that mm, uh, many of the Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, uh, Korean uh, investors in China, they're pretty flexible. Not everybody is flexible. And particularly the smaller, medium-sized companies may be less flexible and therefore more vulnerable. Uh, and uh, I think that, that uh, this is a, a process under which the larger uh, people would have more sophisticated supply chain and, and perhaps lobbying capability in either China or the US will do better. 
but the smaller companies are vulnerable, and I, uh, particularly those with large investments, and I very much re regret that. Thank you. I know there's so many questions I have for all of our distinguished panelists, but unfortunately we are a little bit short on time. Um, so maybe let me see if there are any questions from the audience. If not, I have plenty of questions <laughs> that I can ask the panel. Oh, I do see that there's a gentleman in the back with his hands up. Is there a microphone that we can provide to the gentleman? Program organizers. Oh, here. Well, I, you know, uh, at least I changed the talk earlier. I'm, I'm my own uh, engineering company, but, but that doesn't affect. But I do have an overseas factory. Uh, you know, 100% of my products are returned into the U.S. And I guess with this uh, haircut, 10, 15%, you know, uh, new choice imposed to all the, uh, the products from China. I wonder if there's any U.S. association, you know, that we come together to make uh, any effort to stop this Trump decision, you know? Uh, I, I, I wonder, uh, maybe specifically Mr. Allen over here, see if he, you know, somebody got to stop this, right? Otherwise, I mean, we all get, get hurt in this country, right? Suddenly, my supply chain over, I, I, at one time I got three quarter uh, market share of the U.S. On, on one specific product. Who get hurt? We all Americans are here, you know? Somebody got to stop this. Thank you. Um, so, um, I, I, I feel for the small business people who are, who are relying on a, on a supply chain that has been very productive, very effective, very successful over the years. I, I truly do. Um, there are a lot of uh, trade associations that are urging uh, the president to hold his hand. Uh, the retail uh, associations are uh, very active. You can see their advertisements, I think, very effective. Uh, our organization um, is, has counseled uh, that tariffs are not an appropriate uh, response um, uh, from the very beginning, and we will continue to do so while we continue to urge the two governments to negotiate and reach a solution uh, that uh, is fair uh, for all. Um, I am uh, not optimistic over the short term. Uh, I think I would share that with Yukon, um, that, uh, that right currently today, um, there are no neg negotiations planned uh, or scheduled that I know of. That's not a good sign. Um, so we are urging uh, the two governments uh, to come together. Uh, my board will be going to China in a week uh, and speaking at the highest levels to urge uh, compromise, to urge agreement, to urge that the tariffs on both sides be put away. Tariffs hurt Americans, all right? Who pays for this? Americans pay for it. Uh, we pay for it in higher prices or with inflation. Uh, this is, uh, I'll let the economists speak to that. But um, uh, at least from my trade association's uh, point of view, we have been very active uh, on this uh, subject uh, and we will remain active until uh, the problems are resolved. And I hope that that is sooner rather than later. But I, I, I don't want to leave people with a sense of false optimism here at all. Um, I um, uh, am concerned that these tariffs will remain in place uh, at least through November uh, 30th of the meeting of the two presidents. And if it's not resolved at that time, well then when will it be re resolved? And the longer the, the tariffs are in place, 
the more the distortions will grow, and the more particularly smaller, medium-sized businesses with unflexible supply chains will be hurt. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so we can maybe take one more question. Okay, so this lady in the blue here. Well, thank you, panelists. My question is that do we have any other alternatives to solve the disputes, trade disputes between the United States and China other than the uh, tariff wall? I mean, that's the question. And can we promote the positive energy between U.S. and China and let us do not hate each other, but you know, China and the United States should work with each other to achieve the win-win result? That's the question for the panel. Thank you. Maybe if I may ask uh, Yukon to address that question first, and then happy to have others chime in as well, is because uh, you've talked about com competition, oh, no, yeah. you've oh, talked yeah. about the origins. What's the resolution? I, I, I agree, Craig, that the problem is the stalemate that's going to persist. And your question was, what are the alternatives for dealing with this? And the reason why I think we have a little bit of pessimism here is that the trade, uh, the, the trade and transit TPP was a perfect vehicle for dealing with this kind of an issue. It sets the kind of standards for the Asia region. And my assumption was that China would want to join. Therefore, America's concerns in terms of China's practices could be part of that discussion. But the administration has canceled the TPP. The next possibility is a strict bilateral investment treaty between America and the United States to address these investment issues. The administration has not been enthused about that because it's an Obama-era initiative. So let's put it on the side table. So we've eliminated the two most obvious forms which you've indicated. So I talk about the WTO. America hates the WTO, right? It wants to get rid of it, but it's the only global body and though many people hate it, there isn't anything else around. But the WTO cannot surface as a real issue on the initiative of America, which doesn't want it. So I talk about the fact that the savior has got to be Europe. The European economy is much more integrated into the Chinese economy than most people realize. And many of you go to China, you go to the shopping centers, look around at the stores, 80% of them are European. Okay? You can't find an American store. <laughs> They're all European brand names. And the equipment, the high-end appliances. So America, Europe's involvement in the Chinese economy is about two or three times that of America in the industrial export sector. So this trade war is going to hit them hard because they use China as a base to export to the rest of the world. So here's the issue. You, Europe has strong strategic ties with America. Europe does not have a great power conflict that America does. Europe's going to be negatively affected. The question then is, can Europe work with US, China, and Japan to basically say this doesn't make any sense? And the only thing we have now is a WTO. And you will note maybe a week ago that Europe came out with a manifesto saying the WTO needs to be strengthened to deal with these kinds of issues. So this is not a short-term process, however. It's what I call an obvious but unlikely solution. I think that the president has been misinformed. This, the, you, this problem has to be reframed. It is not a US-China bilateral problem at all. Rather, it's a multilateral problem. Nigeria, uh, Argentina, Uganda have similar problems with dealing with China. This is a global problem, and it is poorly framed as only a U.S.-China bilateral issue. In framing it as a U.S.-China bilateral issue, U.S. companies and U.S. workers and U.S. farmers, particularly ginseng, <laughs> are going to be hurt. And uh, that is not necessary. So thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. By, by, to by our the way, let oh, me sorry. add. A, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, I want to add something. You know, uh, I probably think more uh, naively. I think the solution is there on the table. It's just uh, you no, know, we don't uh, really go for it. 
why there are some other issues I think I worry about. There are some other hidden agendas I worry about. You know, think about the uh, United States. Why, you know, we had this election? Why, you know, we're talking about a Gallup's uh, survey? No, I don't trust Gallup's survey anymore. It's just it's how, you know, this, how divided this, uh, our society is. And also there are issues in China we, we worry about. A lot of people worry about it too. You know, business people worry about you know, where China is going to. So um, there could be a lot of uh, other issues we have to worry about. Uh, if it's a uh, uh, trade issue, it can be solved. If it's strategic competition, then we are in the long, long haul. Okay, so first of all, Okay, so finally, let's give a round of applause, a big round of applause, to all of our distinguished panelists this morning. I encourage all of you to approach our panelists and our experts, maybe on the margins of today's conf conference and meetings. And certainly, I apologize that we can't cover all the issues, but thank you again for your participation.